If we want to measure the half-life of a substance, uh, it's actually pretty important to be able to do this. And again, this is one of the things in the curriculum that the IV wants you to be able to state. So if you want to actually measure the half-life, uh, the first step is to actually, um, you have to measure the background, I better write this down, so measure the background activity. So what I mean by that, remember activity meant the decays per second. So the reason we do this is because the background activity there's going to be stuff caused by everything around you. So there's going to be, for example, uh, rocks. Um, there's going to be you know, radioactivity happening from space. It's even going to come from you since you have some radioactive uh, materials inside you. So it's really important to do this right here, to actually measure this. The reason is because then we'll subtract it away. See, in uh, both of these cases here, for short half-life and long half-life, we're going to have to measure the background activity and then subtract it away. That's because we want to actually find out the activity of the substance, not what's going on in the background. So for a short half-life, uh, what we can do, we just, it's actually quite simple. We just measure the activity of the substance. And then we just graph it. So for example, I could be measuring uh, the activity versus time. So let's just say I do the activity here. And this could be in uh, decays per second, which remember are called becquerels. So let's say I do the activity uh, versus time, and that can be in seconds or years or whatever. It has a short half-life. It'll work nice if it's in seconds, obviously. Let's just say it starts off with a certain amount of activity. And after a while, since there's less of them, it actually will go down again. Just like we talked about before, after a certain time, the activity will go down to half of itself, and that means then that we'll have a half-life here. Now, the reason why I can do this, it seems like, well, can we really do this since uh, this activity equation is not the same as what I'd shown you before for uh, masses? And it turns out, though, there is an equivalent one. Okay, so this one here, we could actually just, uh, we could just graph it, and from there, we could get it. Okay, but then uh, if we have a longer half-life, we'll have to use this equation here. So instead of n equals n zero e to the minus lambda t, we can actually say a equals a zero e to the minus lambda t. So in this case here, if we have a long half-life, that means that it's very difficult. You know, if we graphed just excel, um, not acceleration, uh, if we graphed uh, activity versus time, if it's a short half-life in seconds, we'll probably see something happening. There's no problem. But what if your activity uh, doesn't change much over time? Because if your half-life is long, I mean, half-lives can be millions of years. So it's not like you're just going to sit there and wait a million years in order to be able to tell what your graph looks like. I suppose you could, but that'd be pretty boring. So instead, we can actually do something a little bit more clever. We can actually get it not from this curve, which would have to wait at least one half-life in order to see it. What we can actually do, we can graph something a little bit different. Let's again look at this equation here, a equals a zero e to the minus lambda t. We're again going to be measuring the activity of your substance. And of course, you're going to subtract away your uh, background, just like in the first one here. You had to measure your activity, and you had to also uh, subtract your background. But now when you measure this activity, what you're going to do, well, let's just actually take a look at what we'll have to do here. If we look at this right here, uh, well, actually, I'll write it down first, and I'll explain why that is. So first, we'd measure the activity, and after that, we would actually graph, and I'll explain why this will be in a second. So ln of a versus time. It turns out the gradient will be equal to minus lambda. And from that, from lambda, of course, you get to t1 half, just ln2 over lambda, like we had found before. So that's how you could do it. Now, how in the world did I get that? I want to show you that. I think it's pretty important. So this is kind of the key to it. So let's look at how we actually get to that. Let's take this equation, a equals a zero e to the minus lambda t, and let's do what we were doing a long time ago when I was showing you how to linearize. Okay, so at the beginning of the chapter 13, uh, or the topic 13 videos, I showed you some examples of how to linearize something. Well, I actually want to linearize this, a equals a zero e to the minus lambda t. The first thing I'm going to do is actually drop my a zero down. So I'm going to have a divided by a zero 
equals e to the minus lambda t. Now, of course, I want to get rid of my e. So the idea is I want to graph you know, something versus time. So I want my t sort of on its own, so I want to get rid of my e. So in that case, then it's going to be natural log of a over a0 will be minus lambda t. Now I can work a little bit further with this. We've done things just like this with our n equation, but we can do ln of a minus ln of a0 equals minus lambda t. All I'll have to do now is if I move this term to the right, so by throwing it over, I end up just adding it. So then I'll have minus lambda t plus ln of a0. If you look very carefully at this right here, this has been linearized. In other words, it looks just like y equals mx plus c form. Okay, It sort of looks like this. And the reason is, take a look at this equation here carefully. It turns out it looks just like this. Well, you may not see it, but it does. So let's uh, explain things, why things are the way they are. So if I graphed ln of a as my y, and I made t, I made that my x, then what would I get? Well, then this minus lambda, that would be my gradient. And if I graphed uh, it, then I would get ln of a0 would be my y-intercept. So that means if I graph it, so let's actually show what it looks like. So if I actually did this graph, so here and here, this so here is just t. And this is ln this time of a. It won't have any units now. This right here, uh, natural log won't have any units anymore. But now I expect to get a straight line. In fact, it'll have, start off, let's say, up here maybe, and then it goes down like a, a straight line like this. This y-intercept will be ln of a0. And my gradient will be equal to minus lambda. And again, once I have lambda, what do I do? like I talked about here. So I said, you measure the activity, you graph ln versus time, and your gradient will be minus lambda. And from that, you get t1 half, because ln of two divided by lambda gets you t1 half. So hopefully that's clear. Uh, it seems like a weird thing to do, but the reason we do it is because we didn't have enough time to wait for a whole half-life. See, in the first one, we had lots of time uh, because the half-life is so short that the, you know, we should be able to see a few half-lives happen, so we can maybe take an average. But for something with a long half-life, we don't have time to wait for a whole half-life. So we could just graph activity, but the problem is we wouldn't see much from the curve. So that's why if we're a little bit clever about it, rather than uh, just graph the activity over time, if we graphed natural log of the activity versus time, we should get a straight line. And from that, the gradient gets us lambda, and from lambda, we can get the half-life by this equation here. Okay, so this right here was actually the sort of the key to doing it right here. And I just wanted to explain how we got what we got.